And you spent a lot of time in China. You were here originally in 1984, Ray. What are you seeing in terms of the opportunities now, given the changes that have been underway uh, in the capital markets and the economy here in China? Well, there's uh, tr you know terrific opening up and of the capital markets and a lot more liquidity. You know, generally speaking, these are second largest markets in the world, and they're opening up for investment. And um, so, I'm very excited about that. It's particularly exciting to me because, as you mentioned, I came started coming in 1984, and I can tell you that I've watched. And been part of that evolution in 1989. I remember an organization that was put together by uh, seven companies to develop a stock market, the first stock market in China, and it was in a dingy hotel room. And, uh, and these seven people uh, put together the first development of the stock market, and. I've watched the uh, development of their skills, uh, their organizations, uh, the financial institutions, and it's been a pleasure because uh, that's developed in much the same way as the whole economy's developed. So there's a modernization, there's an energy here. That's uh, terrific. So I'm excited it, to be part of it. Those who flag the concerns around and, and suggest and, and point to the fact that in terms of reforms, there have been some step backs, whether that's Yuan liberalization or capital controls that have been imposed, or the greater role of the SOEs here. How do you square that with other advances that are taking place in China? How do you read that? I, I think that, uh, first of all, I think people put too much emphasis on the short term problems. Like, uh, ever since I was here, there was always reasons not to believe the success. Okay, so now look at the force behind that success. When I was here, I remember being a guest in 1984 of CIDIC, and uh, it's a 16-story office building, and I would look outside, and, they, and there were hutongs. Hutongs were just the little neighborhoods. And I said, with the opening up, there was going to be the capital markets coming in, and there's going to be buildings and everything. And so if you look at the path over there, there's just too much emphasis on that. And I think what you're probably re uh, referring to is maybe the, the leveraging process. Uh, maybe that's uh, the issue. But uh, when I look at the uh, state-owned enterprises, uh, it used to be five or six banks would lend money all to state-owned enterprises. And there was no small and medium-sized enterprise capital markets. Uh, since then, about a third of the lending is coming from um, a new capital markets, and so there's access to capital for small businesses to grow and so on, and new savings visit. If I look at the links, the, uh, the Hong Kong Direct, and I look at the free economic zones and all of that development, the development of CDS markets or bond markets and all of that development, there's been wonderful development. So I think it's important not to view it in this westernized uh, perspective of, of some of these things. It's been, anyway, very, very effective. And if we're talking about something like the, the issue of the deleveraging, I mean, I th I've watched many countries go through the, the, the leveragings and manage that. But uh, read on the size and scale that China faces. Oh well, no. I, first of all, um, if you look at if you look at debt problems of countries, the most important issue is whether they have a debt denominated in their own currency or whether they have a debt denominated in a foreign currency. Then you look at how sizable the debt is. So the de the debt ratios here are not as bad as the debt ratios. Their debt ratios are less than our debt ratios, and also it's denominated in their local currency. So now you have to go to the segments of the debt. There is a local government debt issue, and then there are certain parts of the uh, system in which there's um, uh, issues to be dealt with. Um, there's a forthrightness in looking at that. I have conversations, and I could say that the understanding of those issues and the being very forthright and, and bringing up the deleveragings, I would say, w isn't this admirable by comparison to what we experienced in the 2008 financial crisis? In other words, you didn't get a heads up from the government that said, now we're going to manage deleveraging. You had, 10 years ago, you had a financial crisis in which they went into 
to it and then they're in a reactive mode. This is a proactive mode of something that becomes manageable. So, and, and if you take a debt, any debt crisis, even a, the worst kind of debt crisis, it comes and goes. 2008 financial crisis in us was dealt with with monetary and uh, certain fiscal policies and, and changes and so on. And then there's 2009 and since 2009 we had a big bull market as a result of that. These things, the financial crisis is of, of store, they come and go. They're short-term things. You have to look at the innovation. You have to look at the capabilities. They're unleashing an economy that has innovation. There's entrepreneurship that is existing here that never did exist here. The vitality is a terrific place. So look beyond these things or ask yourself whether they can be well managed and also look at the capabilities of the people. Somebody like Lou Hu is a very capable person. So I think that those are the things that matter most in terms of picking and a good broadly, place. Broadly, there are opportunities for the fund management industry in China, given the changes and the reforms. Uh, I think th uh, um, the Chinese um, government will determine how welcome uh, outside investors are. And as they open up, um, you know, we, we'll be there and others will be there. Uh, my sense is that uh, there'll be a broad opening up um, if, because they also want to bring in the skill sets. You know, one of the great developments in China is to bring in the best world-class standards. If you want to build an automobile industry, you bring in General Motors and you bring in the best automobile companies to help to bring about world-class standards. Because financial reform is such an important thing. It'll be part of a process to bring in the, you know, the best in the world to try to bring in the best practices. Switching focus to Europe, how do you view the climate in Europe? Are you concerned, for example, about political risk in the region, whether it's Italian elections or, on the macro level, the ECB's handling of their unwinding of their balance sheet? How do you view the, the picture in Europe? I think that um, there's today and there's what it used to be. And we, the, uh, the ECB and Mario Draghi should be congratulated and thanked for taking it through the crisis. There's always a debate as to what the, the best processes are. Are um, did you print money and, uh, and the Germans argue with the, uh, the Italians and so on, and now look at it. Okay, we have been through the worst debt crisis. We have had a, what I call a beautiful deleveraging. We're now uh, where that crisis is 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 largely behind us, and we're now in a situation where growth is improving. Uh, oh, of course, it could always be better. You can have more structural reforms, but there have been quite a bit of structural reforms, and. So um, we're in a situation in with which growth is positive. The debt crises are not as cr uh, as, uh, as difficult to, uh, by any means as they were, and we're not having an inflation problem. The inflation is to get it up to two percent, and that's a struggle. If that's a big problem, that's not a big problem. The issue, of course, still has to do with uh, keeping this expansion going, because if you talk about the political issue, then there's the challenge between the haves and and the have-nots, and this is a worldwide challenge. And so you must not have an economic slide back, because if you have an economic slide back, that's where the real political problems are. That's where the challenges are. So I'm not worried about too much inflation in, in Europe, okay? And I'm not worried about that. And I think that we're on a good track. Um, and uh, of course, there will be the political issues. There are always the political issues. But put that in perspective, they're much less than they have ever been in the last I don't know, 20 years. And are you worried to sticking to inflation? Are you concerned? Should we be concerned? Should investors be concerned about inflation in the U.S.? And how difficult is the job going to be for the new Fed chairman? I think it's, I think it's so funny, you know. Uh, when I hear your question, uh, should we be concerned about inflation? I'd ask you what? Because it's too low or because it's too high? Okay, you know, uh, that's a, that, isn't that a funny question? Because uh, there's a lot of concern that it was too low. Should we be concerned that it's too high? I don't think we should be concerned that it's too high. We're still struggling to get it to 2%. If you get 2.5% inflation, you know, uh, uh, is that a problem? I don't think we're going to hit 2.5% inflation for a core inflation rate. But is that a problem? If, in Europe, is it a problem that there's too much uh, inflation or too little inflation? I don't know. You never get it perfect, but it's pretty good, you know? So, so, so no, three. I'm not particularly concerned. What I am concerned about is as we go into the later parts of these cycles, 
the challenge of central banks will be to get it perfectly, right? Because where are we in the cycle now? We're in the late um, in in the United States. We're in a later part of the cycle uh, in both uh, of the world. We're in the Goldilocks part of the cycle when it's not too hot and it's not too cold, right? When we have growth and we don't have an inflation problem, that's the beautiful part of the cycle, okay? As we're moving from that beautiful part of the cycle to a little bit later in the cycle as we're moving, then there's the, the, that part in which the brakes start to get put on at different pa paces. In the United States, we're a little bit farther ahead, so we're going to have faster rate of interest rate increases and letting the balance sheets go off. In Europe, we're a little bit behind that. And and so as a result, you'll have a winding down of quantitative easing and not as much movement on the interest rates. So that's where we are in Europe. That's where we are in the United States. And um, so the issues, I don't think, are particularly pressing now. I do think that if we were to roll the camera forward to two years from now and that we're having an up, a lot more, let's say, stimulation, particularly in the United States, we're having a lot more stimulation because of the tax bill and also because uh, liquidity is uh, relatively so we're going to be in a part where the central banks will have a problem getting it right, I think a year or two from now. And, and the Fed has signaled obviously three rate hikes this year, Goldman is saying four. Where would you say the right number is? Oh, I couldn't tell you what the right number is. It depends how things transpire. I know it becomes delicate, and, and the, the important thing is well, nothing is precise. And as we start to pick up, we'll figure out whether that is three or two or four and, you know, get that uh, right. I do know that um, it has to be careful that it's not much faster than is discounted in the curve. And right now, um, you know, as you say, it's between three and four, which is discounted in the curve. And if they stick to that kind of pace, I, I don't think it would be particularly problematic. Let's touch on your book. Have any companies taken on the principles? You've written the book, Principles, Life and Work. Have any pension funds of any companies adopted, adopted your principles that you've laid out there? Um, there's uh, a number of companies, I won't mention the, the names of them, that are um, uh, now um, examining them, I should say, um, and t tending to be more um, cutting edge, more Silicon Valley type of companies, tending to be more um, entrepreneurial type of companies, uh, uh, and we'll, you know, we'll see how that uh, that happens. Yeah, implementing that transparency works in some companies, but it's not going to work in every company. The radical transparency that you talk about, the kind of radical transparency you have at Bridgewater. Uh, well, let's, let's stop and take a look at this. Okay. Nobody in their heads has all the right answers, right? There's a range of thinking. We all think differently. And to be able to have an idea meritocracy in which people can be very straightforward with each other and then together work on finding out what's true by understanding the art of thoughtful disagreement is very powerful. Because in order to be successful in the markets or in order to be successful as an entrepreneur, you have to be an independent thinker. Uh, because the consensus is built into the price in the markets. So you have to be an independent thinker and be right. And that's true as an entrepreneur. You have to be an independent thinker and be right. And you don't know if you're right. And the greatest risk is that, uh, the great, one of the greatest tragedies of man, is people holding in their heads wrong opinions that they're confident about and they don't put out and stress test them. So what am I talking about? What's the problem of being radically truthful and radically transparent with with each other. It may be uncomfortable for some people, then I say get used to it because it's effective. So what's the problem with being radically truthful and radically transparent and to bring in the best ideas for independent thinking? It improves the probabilities of being right. 